And thank you all for being here tonight. We're, we're just going to have a, a brief set of introductions here and then wade into this panel. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been 30 years, uh, and none of these people look like they're old enough to have been starting the newspaper 30 years ago. It's also true that you can see the difference between the mainstream media and the alternative uh, media. I'm the only person wearing a tie. <laughs> so, Before we get started, I, we do want to do a quick set of introductions here. Is that okay now? And let uh, these folks introduce themselves and tell a little bit about uh, how and when they are, just to briefly tell when they joined the Indy. I think some of them are first generation uh, folks and were here at the creation and some of them came on a little bit later. But uh, Jim, why don't we start with you? Okay, uh, my name is Jim Overton. I was the associate publisher of the paper from its founding in 1983 through the summer of 1988. Hi, I'm um, Ann Morris, and I um, got to join the Independent as a free intern. Um, I, and, and, um, I guess that was 1983, and um, actually got then hired as a full-time writer at the huge salary of $5,000, I think, which uh, seemed like a lot of money at the time. But um, was that a month? Yeah. <laughs> it was a year, but anyway, it, it was it was a lot at the time, and um, um, I was with the paper until um, 1986. Barry Yeoman, I think I may be the only second generation. Uh, person here. Um, I joined in uh, 1986. I was the senior staff writer and I left in 1999. I'm Steve Shule. Um, I was uh, a, the publisher of the paper um, for a long time. And, uh, <laughs> and then in uh, 99, I stopped being the publisher of the paper and uh, but have been uh, the president of the company in, uh, until we sold it. I'm D. Reed, and uh, can you hear me? I'm D. Reed. I was the uh, associate editor, the first associate editor for the Independent. Um, so I think that was January, maybe De January of '83, maybe December of '82, <coughs> when it was first getting started. I was there full time till '86, and then I freelanced and um, worked part time till '89. I'm Elisa Johnson. I'm, I was a feature writer. I started in 83, right out of college, and was there for a year and went to graduate school after. <laughs> and I'm Sue Watson. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Sure's cut. There you go. How's that? Yeah. I'm Sue Watson. I started in 83. I was hired by Greg Swanson after the first issue came out, but they couldn't afford to have me come on for another month or something. <laughs> I lingered in the background and worked there until uh, the paper sold in September of last year. Okay, thank you all very much. Let's just, for a minute, let's, let's uh, trail back in time to middle of April 1983. Uh, Flashdance was showing at the center and Monty Python's Meaning of Life was on at South Square. At the Ramadi Inn, you could get two primary dinners for $11.95. <laughs> the Durham Savoyards were about to open Patience, which Jim Wise called a very funny uh, production. And Joe Hackney filed 10 bills in the State House calling for a halt to prison construction. And the Bulls got their first win of the then three game old season. <laughs> it's tax day, and Two significant things happened on April the 15th of that year. In Tokyo, Disneyland Japan opened. <laughs> and in Durham, North Carolina, the North Carolina Independent came out with its first issue. If I remember correctly, and I don't remember all that well, uh, we're still talking about go-go, I mean about, uh, about uh, the uh, flash dance and, and, uh, and music being out there. It was a fairly conservative time, as I recall, in the country. So, Steve, since you and my old friend and, and Chronicle colleague uh, Dave Burkhead decided in 1978, five years earlier, to start an alternative paper. I think it was 1978. I, it says so in Wikipedia, so I know it must be true. In 1978, you guys decided that you were going to start a paper uh, probably sooner than five years later. What were you thinking? <laughs> That's a good question, Bob. Um, we were not happy 
with the Herald. <laughs> Some things never change. <laughs> or the News and Observer, and we were involved in politics around here, and so um, I think the precipitating incident, and everybody who's up here now has heard the story too many times, or was a participant in it, but we, uh, we were arrested uh, at the, the Kudzu Alliance uh, demonstration against Sharon Harris' nuclear power plant, and uh, we were arrested over in, uh, at the, in Raleigh at, the, uh, at their corporate headquarters. It's a good story in itself. I won't tell the whole thing, but just to say that along with us was Barbara Burkhead, who is here, Dave's mom. Barbara, why don't you stand up? And there were 17 of us. Um, we, I think we dubbed ourselves the Raleigh 17. Uh, but, we, uh, but Barbara was, there was a nice picture of Barbara spread-eagled on a police car at the, at the, uh, in the front of the News and Observer. But on our way back and forth to the, uh, to the trial, we, we, we were driving with, with Dave's dad, Ken, in, van, in the van back and forth to the trial, and we were talking about how we didn't like the coverage that we were getting and why don't we start a newspaper. And um, I guess that's, that's what it was. And, uh, and, and then we, I guess the next thing we did is we asked Jim Overton if he agreed with us, and he said he did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just, it, it really went from there. But it was that, I think that was really the, the precipitating, the precipitating moment. Jim, you were, you were sort of uh, mining the, the till, I gather, in those early days. What, uh, how difficult was it to start up this newspaper? in Durham, North Carolina, a, in 1980, 81, a notoriously liberal town. <laughs> how, was it, how, was it, how was it possible to get this going? Oh, we had the brilliant idea that we were going to sell subscriptions and make this work until, <laughs> what was it, Steve, about a month before the first issue when Greg Swanson walked in and said, well, why don't you just circulate it free and sell advertising? And we went, that's a brilliant idea, we'll try that. And this was the, this was the, the discipline and the, uh, the sort of really carefully thought out uh, uh, strategy we had for our business side. Uh, shall we say, the business side, uh, Steve and I really get the credit for this, was not exactly the most exemplary part of this business. Uh, I have personally... I have personally, as the associate publisher, specialized in calling the printer every two weeks and convincing them that there really was a check on the way <laughs> and that they really would, would get paid one of these days so they should actually keep printing the paper. Uh, I wrote very, um, uh, very cut and dried memos analyzing very logically to the staff why we didn't have enough money to write paychecks. <laughs> So that we would have to go without for a couple of weeks, and then Steve would give them a rousing, inspirational speech about freedom of the media to try to keep them going after we got through the uh, first part of this. So it, it was a little complicated, although. <laughs> really, I would say though, I mean, this is a slightly more serious comment. We didn't, we certainly didn't have the brilliance to realize this, but if you look back on Durham at that point. Durham was really still the neglected stepchild of the Triangle to a large extent, but already the economy had started changing. Here was really the beach had a regulator bookshop, and some of the Carol Anderson starting vaguely reminiscent on Ninth Street, some of the other businesses that came along, Lex Alexander developing Wellspring Grocery, the Magnolia Grill starting, the whole set of restaurants starting to flourish that had really kind of grown out of another time and sometime. There was actually an economic force there that I don't think we really realized that could support the model that we were doing. And while the most advertisers in the Triangle thought that all of our readers sat around reading us at 11 o'clock by candlelight in their <laughs> unelectrified cabin late at night, you know, there, there were actually was sort of this affluent, progressive community that kind of hungered for what we were doing. So while I can't say it was the most astounding financial success from the beginning, we at least did have something that could underwrite that kind of approach and make it possible for us to build a newspaper. What, uh, what were some of the subjects that you tackled in those first weeks and months? Well, I, I can tell you about the first cover story. Um, 
Some of you will remember uh, Armageddon Chemical Company in East Durham, okay? And they had the unfortunate name of Armageddon Chemical Company. <laughs> when the hazardous waste containers in the backyard exploded and started a fire in a residential neighborhood. So that was the first cover story. And I wanted the headline to be waiting for Armageddon, but I think Jim overruled it and for something a little straighter than that. But I think that, for me, what I think of when I think of the independent is that at that time it was a, um, what do we call that, bi-weekly. It came out every two weeks. And so we were trying to cover what the daily newspapers couldn't or wouldn't. I mean, in many cases they couldn't. They had their own beats. They were doing breaking news or whatever. But I think it was... Um, maybe Garrett Epps that said, you know, there are stories out there right under our noses that are not being covered. And they range from the sacred cow, which was, you know, really the golden calf of tobacco, to race, to gay rights, to the death penalty. And the Independent took those stories on, you know, full, head on. And, um, and, and, Nobody else was writing those stories. So we had it all to ourselves, which was really great. Um, I'll just give you a real brief example about tobacco. I mean, when I, when I wrote, uh, that, was, that became my beat. I didn't have the city hall beat like a daily newspaper reporter has. I had the tobacco beat. It was wide open. When I went and covered meetings, I was the only reporter there. So um, after I realized that there was a huge story there about 350,000 Americans dying every year because of tobacco, you know, seven Vietnams, more than cocaine, AIDS, DWIs, drugs combined, um, that we ought to ask the people that are um, lobbying and promoting tobacco about, you know, just what they do. And in the process of going around and visiting all these very nice people who are public officials in the tobacco uh, government agencies and in the lobbying arms, I would ask them all about their business. And the first visit I had, uh, in Raleigh, in a government building, the tobacco official, uh, before I even sat down, asked me if I'd like to smoke. <laughs> this is back when you could smoke in an office. And I said, no, I don't smoke. And he said, well, neither do I. And I said, really, why? And he said, well, my doctor told me to quit. So I remember to ask that question of every official and every lobbyist I interviewed. And every single one of them said, I don't smoke anymore. I quit for health reasons. And that became the story. It was an obvious story run under our noses. What, uh, what kind of reaction did you get to some of those stories in the early days? Uh, you weren't the first alternative weekly on the block. The Anvil had been around earlier, but it died. So you all were taking, sort of coming to a void. What reaction were you getting, both positive and I'm really interested in terms of, of negative? I suspect you weren't why, you were not universally welcomed. The community. Elisa or Andy? Yeah. Well, I, I remember I covered the legislature um, after I'd been to Independent a couple years, and um, we were writing really different stories. And um, I think people thought we were a little crazy. You know, I mean, I just remember um, people in Ro the legislature thought um, that we were sort of fringe, and that was the way they sort of dealt with it. But the press corps, I mean, it was interesting, the press corps took us seriously and would often um, follow the stories that we did. So you knew that there was something to it because you would write a story and then the next thing the Charlotte Observer would have the story or the News and Observer would have the story. Um, but I think for the most part, um, I mean, I felt like Durham was supportive, but maybe that was just the community that we were fortunate to be surrounded by in Durham. I mean, I, I felt... I, mean, I, know, I know at Bullock's Barbecue we ran into some trouble, but <laughs> I think there was a very supportive community in Durham. That's the way I felt. Yeah. Um, so I had the honor and uh, daunting challenge of following Anne as the, 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 the state legislative reporter. And um, we, uh, my, 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 my experience when we were writing about, you know, should we should we declare Governor Jim Martin the state vegetable, um, <laughs> was that that people were confused and angry until thirty seconds into the conversation when there was this moment of cognitive dis 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 dissonance when they couldn't quite reconcile the short guy with the bad suit and the stutter uh, who was being very nice to them 
and the angry voice under the byline. And that was, that was sort of how, how I think any number of us uh, managed to navigate through a sometimes very conservative world. We were nice. We were, we were people who you would like to have a conversation with. And somehow um, we, we wiggled through that sense of cognitive dis dissonance. Um, I, 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 I should also say that in the early years we were getting criticisms from the left. Um, we were not sufficiently progressive. Um, we were we were saying things that were sometimes you know tilting at at the left sacred cow. Um, I remember any number of stories I did about state legislators on the right, where basically I said you know I don't agree with this guy on anything, but he's brilliant, and we got some strong criticism about that. Um, so, so it was coming at us from both directions. I'm really curious about the, the, the sort of the attack from the left, which is not uncommon. I mean, the left has a way of you know, circular firing squads becoming part of its, its, its DNA. But talk about some of the things that you did that, that, were, that, that rankled um, well, the more liberal folks, who, or the more radical folks who might have been looking at you. I can remember one, if you don't mind, just because I still could probably start gripping my seat with uh, anxiety over this, is that, that Catherine Fulton, our editor, decided that she that this was a time where the uh, anti-abortion movement in North Carolina was really starting to crank up. Uh, and she thought it was important for us to educate people about who they were and where they were coming from. And they had a particularly charismatic young leader. I believe it was Ralph Reed, wasn't it, too? Some of you may recognize his name. He was then around NC State and was sort of leading the... Uh, the charge, but as I recall, we had a visual on the cover that was effectively what the pro-life movement, as they would have described themselves, would have wanted of a of a fetus. And uh, I would say, within five hours of the time that hit the streets in Durham, there were leaflets on every single car on Ninth Street declaring a boycott against the Independent, and that uh, and we ended up with more fire over that issue than anything I can remember we ever said about the right or anybody else. So it was, uh, it was quite a bit of controversy for quite some time after we did that, that, that paper. So that was the one that really stands out. Well, yeah, that, that, that must have been unsettling. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, so you were, you were around for a really long span of this time and, and in charge for a good chunk of it. Talk a little bit, if you will, about how you think the Indy changed over the years, or did it? I mean, would, if any of you had walked into the newsroom that didn't stay very long at the beginning, and you'd come back 25 years later and walked in, how would it have looked different, or felt different? Oh, gosh, it changed so dramatically. I mean, I'm hearing uh, Anne and Jim talk about, and Dee talk about how, what a short period of time they were there. I, it, you know, I was there for. I know I was there 29 years, and I sometimes lose perspective about about how long folks were there. You weren't there very long at all, but we were all so close knit and tight, and um, you know they didn't mention this, but if you had a job in the editorial department in the early days, you were also required to deliver the paper, <laughs> and you broke your leg. And so I helped her deliver the paper in your pinto, right? Yes. <laughs> so it wasn't very glamorous. That's, actually, that's putting it nicely. <laughs> it was about as unglamorous as you can imagine. Um, our basic editorial room was one big room that I guess David Burkhead had built Yes. You built those? Yeah. Okay, so, okay. So Anne was in on that. Um, very, very small, very, very tight. And um, when Garrett was there as an editor and he was giving comments, you could hear his voice throughout the entire building. It was, it was really amazing. On the other hand, um, that kind of closeness built a lot of camaraderie. So I just remember how tight and dusty and cramped and fun it was. And it seemed to me that Jim was the one person who never, ever left the building. He was there when I got there. 
He was there after I left. I never knew, I, I basically I thought he lived there. And I'm sure he didn't, but he was always there. Alicia, what was your first story? I can't remember my first story, but <laughs> I was just reminded of the piece that I did on turkeys. Oh my God, yes. Oh, t tell us about that, I, that, the, that reaction. <laughs> well, you know, I was not, I, I started an independent right out of college, and I was not a journalist, so Catherine had me out doing stories of interest. And in this case, it was getting close to Thanksgiving, and Garrett wanted a story about, you know, what went on in a turkey farm. He wanted the anti-Thanksgiving story. So I had to go down east and interview a person at a turkey farm. Um, and I think Jenny LaBalm was my photographer. And I got to see what it was like then, and it's a whole lot worse now, you know, with mass-produced mass turkeys. And so I wrote this piece about it. I do remember that the, um, the owner of the turkey farm was not happy with me. <laughs> uh, but, it was a very eye-opening experience, and I learned a lot. And people keep telling me they still remember that, which I find really amazing. Steve, when, when people like the, uh, the turkey farmer were less than pleased with the fact that they'd been in their search spotlight, I'm guessing, just guessing here, that the calls would come to you. Uh, how did you handle them? Um, we wouldn't put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> I, I was hoping it was something like that. <laughs> I will say that we, uh, my favorite t-shirt was, um, and, and we have some of our other indie staff here and they'll remember this as well, but uh, Barry had written uh, what I think is still one of the high points of the Independence uh, publishing career, our, our 29 or 30 years. Um, and uh, it was a series called Highway Robbery, and it was a wonderful, wonderful series about the, the Department of Transportation, and it was months of research, and it was fabulous, and it won, you know, tons of awards, but the best thing about it was the Secretary of Transportation uh, thought he was going to make a point about this story, and he, he said that he, he, the story was meaningless because uh, we were the left-wing attack media from hell. <laughs> So that was an awesome, so, so that's the answer to your question, Bob. We put that on the t-shirt. There, there, was, there was the, I mean, it, it, it truly, when those calls did come in, uh, and we all fielded them at various times, I mean, Sue has fielded probably more than any of us, but, you know, you have to take them seriously, as you know. You have to first figure out, are they right? You know, maybe we did miss it. Uh, you know, it, it, so you have to sort of check that out, and then after you find out you were right, that's when you put it on the t-shirt. Uh, but, but of course there were times when we weren't, and we had to acknowledge that. Uh, but part of the fun of being in the newspaper business, and I don't have to tell you this, is that, um, well, it, it's part of the fun and also part of the difficulty. You know, you, you do get it from everywhere, and, and there is a lot of attention focused on what you, you know, institutionally or, or individually, in the case of reporters, are saying. Uh, you do develop a tough skin, and I think you do have to, to some extent, um, you know, be able to enjoy that. Um, if you can't, I don't think it's easy to, to be in the newspaper business, so. Were there ever any times, particularly that first year or two, uh, I suspect there were times, so what, what was it like when you begin to wonder if you were going to basically make it, if you were going to be able to convince the printer next week that it was time to print. Were, were there moments of doubt in that first year or two, either on your part or any of the staff members who were there? Well, let me make one quick comment on that, and then I think Jim would probably have a lot of perspective. Uh, my quick comment is that we were supported over the years by a group of shareholders. There's a sucker born every minute. <laughs> Uh, without identifying them, I will say that I see four of them here. <laughs> and we are eternally, great, eternally grateful you did not get your money back. We know that. Um, but but uh, Catherine and I uh, and others, uh, including Jim, and uh, you know, we, we raised money from 65 individuals. And so that's how we 
ended up being able to make the pay a lot of the time, especially in the first years. We, we actually were uh, profitable some years, and it's hard to believe. Um, <laughs> but in those early years, we really weren't, and we really struggled. And as I say, I know there are other people out here that, that you know, ex you know, after Jim left, uh, Jewel Wheeler, who's here, was one of the people that had to, you know, balance that budget every time. So Jim. Yes, everyone can. So, uh, if you worked at the Indy, will you please stand up? Yes. Great idea. Yes. Linda Hyde was on our advertising staff. Robin K. Alexander was on our editorial staff. And Jewel Wheeler was our associate publisher. Did I miss anybody? And circulation manager. And circulation manager. And receptionist. And she also... <laughs> <laughs> and she wrote this the staff skit at our retreat. And Barbara Burkhead was our loyal. You came in and, and mailed copies right. every two weeks to all the the little the tiny yeah, the <laughs> tiny little crew of folks who actually subscribed from across the state. You were giving them very customized personal service. Would you add anything, Jim, to the to the to the sort of the the birth pains financially? Well, I think we were the only publication in newspaper history that I know of where for a period of time the advertising staff was making less than the publishing staff because <laughs> on a commission basis there was no money to give to the ad staff. So it was just a, it was just always a struggle. I mean, we, we, we had to rely upon everybody on the staff being very lean and mean. We had to go for periods where uh, all of us had to take pay cuts or no pay at all. Um, but, and there were times where it was really a little depressing when we didn't see the next uh, chunk of cash coming in or we knew we were going into a period where we would really have no advertising support at all. But again, I think it gets back to what sort of Elisa and Sue were alluding to earlier. As long as we could kind of cover the operating nut, the staff was so loyal and was really so dedicated to what we were doing that we had enough goodwill that, you know, I was sort of expecting every day that I walked in that the staff was going to go on strike because we were abusing them so badly. But somehow they stuck with us and gave us the faith to keep the thing going. And that, that made all the difference. Yeah. Jimmy, you clearly touched on something that's come up a lot, and that is that this was, you know, this was much more than a job yeah. for folks. This was a, a, a crusade and a calling. I wonder, particularly if a couple of you who, who joined early on as, as writers would talk a little bit about what, what drew you to this. I mean, this is, you know, going to work for no money and having people mad at you is not a natural act. <laughs> so I, I'm curious what it was that, that drew you into this orbit. Uh, Steve's you know, inspirational speeches or, or what? Um, well, I'll take a shot at that. Um, I was, um, had graduated from college and had spent a year abroad and was looking to come back and um, work in journalism, but I, I had really strong political beliefs, and I didn't know whether I would be happy at a daily newspaper, and um, I had grown up uh, in Roanoke with Catherine Fulton, so she was older, but I knew, knew her, so when I heard about this paper, I was like, this is it, this is perfect. Oh yeah, you can come, but we won't pay you. <laughs> um, but, but I, you know, I had saved up some money, and, and so um, I did it, and eventually, you know, some money came, came along, um, allowed me to, to, to stay, and um, I, I went on to work for sort of traditional daily newspapers for, for 25 years in Durham and Greensboro and then in um, uh, Atlanta. Um, but I guess I really never, you know, I never had as much fun, that's for sure. And I never felt like I got the sort of editorial support. I mean, Catherine, who's not, not here, unfortunately, was a brilliant editor um, and a wonderful person to learn from. As, as was everyone on the staff, very um, nurturing and teaching, and I got a great start in journalism. Um, so for me, it, w it was I was I was young. I didn't need a lot of money. Um, it, it, it was it was absolutely the best experience I could have had. And primary dinners were only like seven bucks a piece of Ramadi, <laughs> and that probably helped too. So as a second generation reporter, um, I came from Lafayette, Louisiana, via Boone, North Carolina. Uh, um, and during my, my, my years as a cub reporter in Louisiana, uh, I, I worked for an alt weekly that was pretty tame and even a little chamber of commerce -y. And at one point, the publisher had come back from a meeting of the Association of Alternative News Weeklies and told me that, that, that she had just met these people who had started a new alt weekly 
it, 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 in Durham, North Carolina that she thought I would really, really like. <laughs> she, she said, now, they will never make it. <laughs> um, but that kind of that kind of pricked up my ears, and when um, when when the economy fell out in Louisiana, and I ended up um, on the unemployment line, and I ended up in the mountains of North Carolina, uh, I I did 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 a little little bit a bit of uh, freelancing for the indie. Um, and it was like the first narrative journalism I had ever done. I was 24 years old, this was 25 years old. This was really heady. I did, I did a story about acid rain in, in the, 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 the North Carolina mountains. Every time I called the, the office, because I couldn't say the why in yeoman without stuttering, I, I, I would say, Barry from Boone. <laughs> it's true. What kept me, um, and you had talked about um, this a little bit earlier, and was the realization that we were pushing the agenda uh, of journalism in a very proactive way. Um, and, it, and it wasn't all, only about subject matter, it was about form. We would do in-depth stories about issues before anyone did in-depth so stories about issues. So we would do a story about uh, prison reform, and we knew that a week from the next Sunday, there would be a story about prison reform uh, on the front page of, of the News & Observer uh, above the fold. When the News & Observer and the Charlotte Observer started doing in-depth stories about issues, we changed our tack and we did more investigative reporting. And then they began doing more investigative reporting. <laughs> you know, and then we did more personal narrative. And, and so, so it felt like we were always pushing the frontier of, of journalism. What's the next big thing? And as soon as it caught on as the mainstream, we, we looked for, for what was next. Steve, one of the things that, that you said when you, when you talked about launching the paper was you were, the, the politics here influenced that. I, don't, I wasn't around in the, in the 80s, and I don't remember the exact chronology. But did you precede the sort of progressive takeover for the first time with the council, or did that happen when you started publishing? Two years after. Two years after, <laughs> which, which leads to sort of my next question, sort of how did you and the somewhat more progressive politics that was coming into play in Durham evolve together or apart, or what was your sort of role in politics in those early days? Uh, so, um, Jim has described the growth of, a, of an economic culture that could support us, and I think at the same time there was a political culture that was growing that could support us as well. And um, those two things, I think, went hand in hand. Um, I think that we were, um, you know, sometimes I, I think of the specific accomplishments of the paper in terms of stories that we wrote, uh, specific stories, whether it be, uh, you know, Dee's tobacco coverage or Barry's highway series or, you know, there's lots of highlights, but I think, uh, in a way, when I think about it uh, in the bigger picture, I think it was, we were kind of part of improving the quality of life, you know, in a sort of every week kind of way that's, that was more than the power of our endorsements, which we were very proud of, or, or the individual stories. You know, it was like every week kind of changing the culture a little bit. Uh, along with all the people that lived here and were doing it as well. So I think we were coming up at a time when the culture was changing and we were kind of m nudging it along. I'm, you know, others may have comments about that as well. I would say one thing about that. I mean, I think the difference that you get out of a more mass circulation publication if you can do endorsements is that there was a certain audience that was picking up our paper that wasn't part of the People's Alliance, wasn't part of the Durham Voters Alliance, or the Durham Committee. So we were hitting a number of people in suburban Durham with a progressive message that they weren't, they, they definitely weren't seeing it in the Herald Sun, and there wasn't really another place for them to see it. So I think in some ways, by virtue of setting ourselves up as a, I always refer to us as, as an unintentional nonprofit, but we were actually a for-profit <laughs> publication. By being able to, to endorse candidates and really focus on those elections, I would say that our electoral coverage 
was picked up by our readers almost as fervently as anything else we did. And we were able to reach an audience that was a little bit outside the standard sort of talking audience of triangle politics, because they just weren't in, engaged in the conversation otherwise. That's part of what alternative news weeklies really do best. Yeah, I, I want to add to that for a second, because I think that um, there was a turning point for the independent, and I think it was after I left when, um, you know, the independent was competing head on with the spectator, which was an entertainment weekly. It was a good entertainment weekly, but they didn't really do politics. And the independent did politics and uh, investigative reporting really well. But when the spectator, well, went out of business, let's put it that way, um, the independent then had that audience and became uh, an entertainment weekly that, you know, is sort of a thinking person's entertainment weekly. And so lots of people still today will pick up the independent because they're trying to figure out what movie they're going to go to this weekend. But then they look at the cover story and then they kind of dip in and they go, whoa, I didn't know that. So that's how, and that was really breaking out of the box before anybody else was doing that kind of crossover, I think. I mean, there were alternative news weeklies, but I think the independent was a little different because it was a little more, it had a little more of an agenda. Most of the alternative news weeklies had an agenda, but it wasn't quite as um, overt, I think. So I think, I think you all were ahead of your time. <laughs> Not, not, a, not a bad compliment. Yeah, Sue, so you're going to add to that? Um, we were bi-weekly until 89, and we went weekly, and that was a big boost to the advertising sales. I was in advertising sales, so we were dealing with the general public of folks that weren't necessarily reading the paper, but they wanted to reach the folks that we, we were appealing to. And a couple of thoughts. It was a big boost when we went weekly because it's hard for people to keep up with a bi-weekly, you know, so. Plus, we double our income. We, you yeah. know, everybody started advertising weekly. But until, you know, it was, pro it was way before we bought The Spectator and shut that down. But we struggled for a while of trying to figure out the difference between the investigative journalism and, and, and A&E, arts and culture. And so, we were constantly shooting ourselves in the foot. And I'll give you a couple examples. We decided we were going to do some events to draw people to, you know, to promote the paper. So we did, we started doing food festivals. So we did this big food festival, I think it was at Northgate. No, it was at Northgate or South Square, I can't remember. And so we, you know, talked to all these restaurants into coming out and, and you know, celebrating food in the triangle. And so what was the cover story that week? Poisoned Harvest. <laughs> Awkward. Poisoned Harvest. So the ad reps would just go, you know. And then the other example of, caused me a lot of angst for a lot of years when we decided to start to do restaurant reviews. Well, we, you know, heart and soul was selling restaurant ads. And so the writers would go about it as an investigative piece. <laughs> well, if you recall, our original restaurant reviewer would only talk about what the noise levels were in the restaurant, <laughs> whether the lighting was sufficient to see the uh, words on the menu, and then we'd finally get around to the wording. And I actually had a friend, this person identified as a sort of middle-aged woman, but I had a friend who pegged this. Well, the guy, because of the noise, he's got to be about 70, and the light is about 70. He writes like a man. He had it down to a T. This was the worst restaurant reviewer for, a, for an advertising-oriented pu publication you could possibly have. So you probably still have great memories of dealing with uh, Mary Bacon at another time over the restaurant oh, review that we wrote for her. That was, uh, that, was, that was the example of where we did have independent editorial policy <laughs> compared to our advertising. If you only had 35 advertisers, every one really mattered. <laughs> well, which, which leads me to a question that, uh, that, uh, that probably followed the time that some of you were there, but, but Sue and, and Steve and others can, can speak to. 
that you talked about a little bit when the spectator went out of business. When did when did you sort of begin to feel that you had a flywheel effect going? When did you begin to feel that hey, this is this is pretty good. We came out this week. We're going to come out next week. We're beginning to get some recognition. You know, this is this is taking hold. What would you say, Sue? <laughs> <laughs> well, for one thing, we didn't make any money until '99, right? Steve and crew would have to go out and raise money every year from shareholders. So that was a big turning point. Yeah, that was, a big that was a huge turning point. What, what, what turned the corner? I think that um, not necessarily because of our uh, brilliance, but just because of our staying power, which we had a lot of. Um, we. We just gradually, you know, clawed and scraped until we had enough readership and enough advertisers and we had cut into the spectator space enough and honestly I think they, well, they made some mistakes and we became extremely competitive with them um, and we had so many strategies, you know, undercutting them on our ad prices. It was easy to do. Nobody wanted to pay anything for our ads. Um, but, um, you know, we had a lot of strategies. And, and at one point, we the one kind of one thing that we really wanted of the spectators was Hal Crowther. And when we got Hal's column um, and we went weekly, as Sue pointed out, that was those those were big moments. You know, so there were several big moments along the way. But I think mainly it was just. Uh, Trying, you know, persevering and having a high quality of, of, of editorial. I mean, I've, I've always been very proud of the quality of our editorial work, and so I think that over time that matters. It doesn't matter like the first week you're out, but I think over time that matters, and, um, and that's so we attracted a large, you know, we had a large audience, so once you have a large audience, you can sell ads. The, uh, w when it finally began to sort of take hold, and you, you, know, you made money, 1999. Did it change your culture? Did it change your worrying about looking over your shoulder? Any? Did you become any more? Did you become less alternative as that happened? Well, I think I might define alternative. You know, I, I mean, it sort of depends on how you define it. I mean, I think that we were still um, alternative to the mainstream media in important ways. Um, I think that, I don't think we ever shot away from a story that we might have shot away from otherwise. I mean, we made a lot of mistakes, we did a lot of things wrong, but I, I do think one of the things we did right was we didn't shy away from stories, and I don't think we ever have. Um, and so in that sense, I would say no. Um, I bet members of our audience might have some thoughts about that too, uh, but I, I, I mean, what we added, uh, and Dee alluded to it earlier, or talked about it earlier, we added arts and entertainment. When we first started out, we had no arts and entertainment. We had a one-page calendar. It came out every two weeks. Carol Wills, who I wish could have been here tonight, edited it. She drove over from Wendell, and she edited our calendar as a volunteer. Um, and, you know, we have, and, and so, you know, we, we, that was it. We were a political newspaper, and that's what we did. And then when we changed to uh, I, mean, I think that we realized that we had to speak to entire human beings, not just kind of, you know, they did want to know what the what movies were good, and even if they happened to be uh, left-wing politically. Um, even left-wing people like to go to the movies. Um, and so I think to, I think that was a, that was a good thing. Um, and, you know, I should say, we have other people, it just reminds me, think about Carol, we have, you know, so many people made contributions that are completely unheralded. Uh, Jim talked about Barbara and the and the uh, labeling, but Joanne Abel, uh, from the very beginning, uh, cataloged the independent. Indexed. Uh, indexed, thank you. <laughs> My library terminology is not good. <laughs> she indexed the independent and made it available to us and to libraries and did that for, for you know, many, many years. Uh, and so, you know, there were a huge number of people that, that made a contribution uh, over the years, and many of you all are out here. You know, some, some of you left relatively early, went on to other things. When you left, what did you miss? Um, all the wonderful people, that's basically it. Um, it was hard not to be at work with
Steve and Ann and Dee, you know, the people that I've seen a lot. Um, and I miss the energy, even though when I came to the Independent, I was not politically savvy at all. I was right out of college. I wanted to be a writer, and a lot of times I was two or three steps behind every conversation that people were having in the office. But I just loved listening to it. And I learned so much about politics and life. I mean, Steve basically drug me from Greensboro to Durham. Um, he insisted that I move. He found a place for me to live. <laughs> um, set up an appointment for me to meet the people in the house. I mean, he really wanted me to be there. And just basically introduced me to tons of people in, in Durham so that I felt at home when I moved here. And you know, I, I had, hadn't had a lot of work experiences up to that time, but I can't imagine that I could have had anything that was as meaningful or connecting as that. And I learned so much working there, even though it was a short time. I learned, um, one of the things that I learned was that I wasn't a journalist. <laughs> And that was okay. Um, I learned that I loved writing, but I also learned that I loved stories because there was one piece that I did, and it was on um, the Pet Cemetery on Highway 70, which soon won't be there. And it was a very emotional piece because at that time, people weren't demonstrating their connections to their animals the way they do now. And so when I started doing the research for the piece, there was a general kind of belief that people who actually buried their pets in cemeteries were a little bit off. And I mean, it sounds really weird now, but I met that kind of um, response from people. So I got to interview this woman who had buried her dog in the cemetery. And she was still, it had been a couple of years, she went to the cemetery every week. She mourned this dog. This dog was a part of her family. And so I did this piece on her, and I remember thinking when it was done, I was really afraid that instead of elucidating that situation and making her seem sympathetic, that I had inadvertently opened her to ridicule. And that was really difficult for me. And so I got in touch with her, and she was perfectly fine with it. But that stayed with me for such a long time, and I had to think about why it was that it was you know, the people that I talked to more than the subjects that I was working on that really helped me. And at the end, I realized that you know, I love stories, I love narratives, I love talking to people, but in a different kind of way than journalists do. Can I add one yeah. thing to that? Um, this hasn't really been said, and it, it should be said here tonight. I think that, for me, one of the most important formative um, things about the Independent was the modeling that I saw about leadership. And that was really, you know, from Steve and Catherine and, and Dee and Jim and, and, and lots of you guys, but it was like how to really run a company in a good way. <laughs> and to give people a voice and to have open meetings and to have everyone really have um, an ownership and a stake in what they were doing. And, you know, I've never really experienced anything quite like that again, but in my own little way, I think I've tried to do that as a boss and as an editor, and um, I, I really learned that from you guys, so thanks. One other quick question for you. Were you gonna follow up anything on that? Well, I was just gonna say that I, I think, uh, I mean, what I don't miss was the, uh, the you know, working in a garage with toxic fumes coming in from the automotive shop next door, sometimes mixed with a little marijuana, which made it interesting. But when you work in close quarters with people who are really dedicated to the same thing that you're dedicated to, there's just nothing like that. There, you, can't, you can't clone that, you can't duplicate it. So it's, it's, it's like a family. You work under stressful conditions, a little bit like a warlike atmosphere. I guess people say they, you know, they love the, the foxhole. And so that's what we had, Elisa. Um, and also, the, um, Anne, um, I think, touched on this. The Independent was an incubator. Um, everybody that worked at the Independent went on to do even better work. You know, they went on to do really good things. And they were influenced by what they got emotionally and professionally from the Independent. 
And I think that's true of all of us. I think maybe Barry's the only one that's still doing extraordinary journalism, I have to say. <laughs> Anne went on to daily newspaper work. Um, Sue, you know, ran the paper for many, many, many years. And Elisa is a very fine academic, a very fine professor, and a wonderful writer. Um, and so, you know, everybody here, I think, was changed by uh, the golden the golden days at the Independent. That's, that may be a good segue into opening this up uh, to you all. Uh, Steve mentioned a moment ago that some folks in the audience may well uh, have some things to add or some questions to ask. Uh, here's your chance to turn the tables on people who ask questions for a living and to ask them questions or to share your memories of the independent. I think we have a microphone for folks. Uh, if you will either step up to it or let it come to you so folks can hear you. We'll open this up to you for a while. Well, I had a quick question. I wondered if uh, the political endorsements were part of the independent when it, in its beginning. So, you know, the way everyone's become accustomed to picking up the independent near election season to, to make a choice. Was that uh, something that started from the beginning? Yeah, it was, and we made a conscious decision to do that. That was one of the reasons we, we didn't go not-for-profit. Uh, we were, you know, Jim talked about this a minute ago, we were for-profit, and one of the reasons is if you're not-for-profit, you can't make endorsements. We knew we wanted to make endorsements. And when we would, uh, we would put out, after every election, we would make endorsements, you know, all over the triangle eventually. You know, we'd make endorsements in as many as 50-some races, and after every election, we would put out a little sheet of paper that was all the elections that were close where we'd endorse the winner because we felt like we'd made a difference and that was big for us. We really, we did, and it's interesting and Sue and I have had this experience that uh, when the Indy, now that the Indy is online and, and has been for many years now, but uh, I think that uh, the, I think that last year, the day the paper came out with the election, election endorsements, I think we had something like 15,000 hits that day, you know, so it's still, I think, one of the best and most important things we've done. Steve, so can I ask a quick follow-up on that? Did, did, did you think your uh, influence was stronger in Durham than in other parts of the Triangle, or how does it play in the, some of the larger, or in the case of Chapel Hill, uh, more unique? Well, I'll, I'll give my thoughts on that, and others may have uh, uh, different opinions or other thoughts. I think there was two things. One is, because our home was in Durham and we're so kind of ideally fitted to the culture here in a way, um, it, it was influential. But I think there's another thing, which is that Durham is an organization town, you know? Uh, there, there, there are political organizations and affiliations that have very powerful followings themselves. And that is less true. Uh, in Raleigh and even in Chapel Hill. And so where there was less affiliation, I think in a way we had more influence. If you weren't as likely to be influenced by political pack, uh, you were then, you're, you were more of a, uh, a, 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 a free agent voter. And I think that in some ways that also carried its own power. Other questions? Hey. Yeah. Um, I was part of, uh, with Barbara Burkett and others, part of the Independent Fan Club. Is on? Yeah. Yeah. I was part of the Independent Fan Club. I'm Jeanette Stokes. And uh, I learned two um, things that come to me at this moment from watching the Independent from its inception. One is that organizations have the personality of the founder. <laughs> and I think that the, uh, the stories that Elisa told about how Steve treated her um, are a good example of an organization that had a cheerleader as its leader. And that people's birthdays got remembered and that sort of friendliness and supportiveness um, uh, has a big effect on people. That if the staff had been fussed at on a regular basis, it would have been an entirely different experience. So it's been interesting to watch organizations in Durham grow, and it seems to me that the organizations pick up 
the personality of their of their leaders. And when Sue became the publisher, and Sue is one of the most fun people in the world, and so the independent being a lively place. And it finally got beautiful offices where people could feel happy just walking. So I, I, I'm very interested in that. The second thing I, I noticed is that um, there was enormous courage in starting the paper, and there was also a little bit of luck over the years, because Steve and Jim and Catherine and David knew from the beginning that it would only take one good lawsuit to put them out of business, and it could have even been a frivolous lawsuit, but the, the cost of fighting a lawsuit could have put them under easily. And so they had lawyers look at the dicey stories and went ahead and printed them and held their breath, and. Um, I don't know what to attribute it to, brilliance, good reporting, good facts, but that didn't happen. The, the independent didn't get sued by somebody who wanted to put them out of business and, you know, cause the kind of financial burden that that could have. So I'm just really glad that a lot of hard work and some luck has made this institution live as long as it had, has because it's had a huge influence on this area and the state. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, a, a couple of things. One is uh, you're talking about con controversies and I remember vividly the picture is sometime maybe in the 80s, early 90s, I don't remember. But it was a, a, a transvestite on the front, in a beautiful, like, satin gown, um, and it said something like, this is what queer looks like, or it, it, queer was in the, just pretty prominent in the title. The why, where I was going, like, promptly stopped carrying in the independent, and I don't know how you ever resolve that, because they do now, but, I mean, that was, that was big. Um, and maybe you could talk to that some, but the other thing I want to just talk about is the rootedness, not just of the independent, of the people in the whole, whatever, I'll, you could say alternative culture, but there are many nonprofits. Southern Exposure, Jim came out of, and um, there were, North Carolina War, and there's so many places where uh, the work was being done that you could do a great investigative series because you could work hand in hand with the people in the community that were totally on top of the other side, so to speak, of the story. On, you know, everything from the poultry, I mean, God, so much. So, uh, I mean, it was a great vehicle to get that stuff out um, for people who are working on it as well. So, so Len, um, um, th th thank you for reminding us of of um, the drag queen who I've forgotten. Um, <laughs> but, but, but to, to speak to that, we actually struggled mightily over how to how in your face to be about both sexual orientation and about race. Um, um, early in my tenure, uh, and I think it actually might have been before my tenure, we gave a citizen award to 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 Eddie 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 yeah. Dave, Dave, Dave Davis, um, who's a wonderful educator. He's now running for for um, city council. Um, back then, we were folded in half, and the photo of Eddie had uh, you know he. It was a, a close-up. He was smiling, but it was folded over over here, <laughs> and and he has fierce eyes, and so so um, so so if it was folded. It looked like angry black man, right? Um, <laughs> and that paper did not move off the stands, and there was a lot of conversation about that, and um, and we struggled a lot with that. Um, likewise. We struggled forever about how how gay we could be on the cover, um, and there were times when we soft pedaled a lot, and there was, and we were moving with the culture, but actually at times a little behind it. We were we were nervous, um, 
by the 90s, we were, we were feeling a little cockier, and um, the, 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 the cover I remember was, was when, when Man Bites Dog brought Tim Miller, who is a California-based performance artist, and we used his um, publicity still, in which he was naked except for, for little labels over his body parts that said what body part it was. Um, we, we, ran, we ran him full frontal on the cover um, with, that pipe, with that body part label too, and... I, 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 oh, and Jesse Helms was behind him, that's right, that's right. I, I, I forgot the... And we lost a number Barry, of Mr. that was historically called the dick. <laughs> <laughs> How many drops did we lose, Steve? Yeah. How many advertisers did we lose? Um, what I remember was that was the same month I was buying a fridge, and I was instructed to go to the appliance store that had dropped us as a drop point uh, um, to tell them that I had seen their ad in the Independent, <laughs> and, um, and then to drop eight hundred dollars on a refrigerator. Did the independent get back in with that? <laughs> I, 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 I have no <laughs> yeah. um, uh, My name is Marty, and I'm also part of the fan club. And since we're talking about sex, I'll say the one thing that's been hardest for me were the personal ads all yeah. along. Mm -hmm. So I'd like somebody to address that. Mm -hmm. I used to have the canned response already. Um, yeah, we always struggled with that. Not the personals, but the sex ads, to make a distinction. Uh, the personals were something that we actually felt good about and made a lot of money on. Um, and I still have people come up and say, we met in your personals and we're married, you know, that kind of thing. The sex ads were a whole different ball of wax, and, and uh, even though Sue's right, it is a me question, she and I both have had to struggle with this over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, it, we went all kinds of ways with it. I remember, Marty, when you wrote us for a while, uh, one time and said, you know, you guys are having Filipino, Filipino bride ads. Mm -hmm. And so we said, okay, we can't have Filipino <laughs> bride ads. Uh, but we still had, you know, sex lines, and, uh, and, and there's a you know, I don't have a, I don't want to make a great defense of it. Uh, we did it to make money, and um, uh, that's why we did it. Steve, just a, a slightly different version of that. As I recall from the day we published, we very stridently said, we will not take tobacco advertising. <laughs> of course, nobody ever offered us any tobacco <laughs> advertising, but it was a really good firm principle for us to be able to take on to show that we were trying to adhere to some, some sort of principle. Jim, that's not true. We turned away hundreds of thousands of dollars. That was after Jim was gone. That was after my time, too. Uh, um, we were not unified as a staff on, on the, uh, the, the issue of, uh, of sex ads. I think we were all unified about Filipino brides and other, uh, uh, um, and other clearly exploitative ads. But, but, for example, there was a period of recorded sex, sex, sex ads. Um, you know, sex talk, and uh, and I know that you know I was holding down the libertarian end of the the uh, 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 of the argument, saying you know there should be a wall between editorial and advertising, and we should not let our editorial mission dictate our advertising, just like we should not allow advertising concerns dictate who we write rest for reviews of. Um, and, and so for me, um, being amoral about advertising, except when there was, you know, clearly people, there were clearly people being exploited, was a part of having up a solid wall. Um, we, we went around in circles um, as a staff and we adopted various policies at different, at different times. Um, there were times when we had no such ads. There were times we had lots of such ads. Um, but 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 it was it was always something that just never had a clear cut answer to us. I have one other quickie on that, which was Carol Wells. I wish she was here today, but we she said, Steve, how come we take 
liquor advertising, but we don't take cigarette advertising. And when I struggled with that, she said, the reason is you like to drink, but you don't smoke. <laughs> Independent, and you had this large, in fact, the paper was dedicated to the lost African American business community in Durham and Raleigh. Yes. So I'm very glad I stuffed this in my Those are collector's items. Yes. 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 And I Thank you for saving those. I think maybe Sue could comment about the 2002 uh, paradox. Well, we bought The Spectator in the fall of 2002 and basically shut it down. But in order to, um, we also purchased the trademark, but we had to continue to use the logo within the body of the paper. So, and that one must have been right after we bought it, kind of announcing it. It was September 25th to October 1st. Yeah, so That's we had just bought it, yeah, so it was breaking brand new news. We were pretty excited. Um, the 1997 cover, Lost World, is actually um, a, 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 a really, really a significant one for for, um, for me. Um, I was was on the staff from ninety from eighty six until ninety nine, and in nineteen ninety six, I went to the Pointer Institute, which is a school for journalists in St. Pete, Florida, to a, a week long seminar on writing about race relations. Uh, and I, I entered that week thinking, well, you know, we're a bunch of groovy liberals, and yeah, we're mostly white, but you know, we know it. we know about race because we're liberals, right? And, and and I had every notion that I walked into rapidly, you know, bitch slapped out of me um, <laughs> by some very smart colleagues, um, a black and white, um, and I came back on a tear, um, and, and 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 I basically basically said that. That, that we needed to completely rethink how we wrote about race. And during that time, we convened um, uh, our meetings at, at, um, at my house, actually, one with a dozen African-American leaders, one with, with, with a dozen Latino leaders, and said, you know, you know t -t talk to us. What are we doing right? What are, what are, what are we doing wrong? Um, we listened as we got some very strong criticism. We did tremendous outreach to hire black writers. Um, that was when we we first hired F.F.A. Ty Himba and Derek Jennings as columnists, and then 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 F.F.A. became became a, a staff writer. Um, um, and um, in that process, one thing I was hearing from African American writers is we want to have a Black History Month issue, and. I was trying to push back and say every month should be Black History Month. They said no, no, no. We want some. They say yes, we should be thinking about African American issues all the time, but we also want a Black History Month issue, and and that was our first. Um, when when it came back um, the, um, the next year, um, we convened um, um, the same group of writers and said. What's what you know? Let's talk about the topic for this year, and there was a consensus that very quickly um, coalesced around the culture of the brown paper bag, which, as you know, a white liberal, I thought, no, we can't do that. But 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 you know, I, I had a Fefe and Derek and Damian Jackson 
you know, all saying, oh yes we can and we will. And we produced a phenomenal section that took the whole issue of street corner culture, street corner malt liquor culture, and looked at it from so many different angles um, that, 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 that it was one of, you know, for me, our proudest moments of that, 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 that on, my, on my period. Mm -hmm. uh, question here? Yes. It's not so much a question as uh, adding on to what Elisa said about the camaraderie at the paper. Um, folks have to remember this is pre-internet, and we had no editorial library at the, at the Independence. So uh, let's say someone was proofreading and needed to know how to spell something. If Jim was in the office, then you knew how to spell it. He was the go-to guy for spelling. Everybody was go-to for their own particular area of expertise. and. Uh, you know, we, the, the support staff had sort of a, a Rolodex access to people uh, like Bob Sheldon at Internationalist Books who could uh, verify facts. It was, it was a lot tougher putting out a paper in those days. And I think it brought the staff a lot closer together to have to depend on each other. Uh, in those ways. And I also wanted to uh, recall that, at least by the time I got to the Independent in 1985, one of the reasons that we didn't really do a calendar was not just because the Spectator was publishing, but because the Guide was also still publishing. Wow. And they were it. I mean, you know, between the Spectator and the Guide, there was no reason, really no reason, uh, for us to go in that direction. Yeah. I just, uh, you're so right about that it was a really different time. And it just rem it makes me remember a funny story that involves uh, Stephen Barry Jacobs. Um, the Independent, uh, you know, in the early years, we didn't even have computers, really. Uh, I had, a, I had a, a K Pro portable computer that was like the size of a movie projector that I dragged into the office. And, and I had a manual typewriter at home. And then Dave Burkhead would, you know, we'd write our stuff and then we still have to hand it to him and he'd retype it. But it was a huge breakthrough when we got a couple of, what were they? A couple Victors. of computers, Victors, two of them. And, uh, you know, there were like, I don't know, eight of us, and there were two computers. So from they. From Martin Eakes. From Martin Eakes, <laughs> yeah. All those connections, Jim. And so they put these two computers in this walk in closet, basically. <laughs> and the only problem with the setup, well, there were two problems. One was the fumes from the uh, automotive shop next door would waft through into that closet and you would, you, you know, I, it's amazing nobody passed out. Um, and then the second problem was that the, um, there was no outlet in the closet, so you had to run an extension cord over the wall, the drywall that Burkhead or somebody put up, and then you plugged it into an outlet on the other side of the wall, which was next to a wall clock. Or just keep that picture in mind. So, um, Steve, do you remember Steve and Barry Jacobs went to cover this really fun event that we all went to, but they wrote about it, which was Jesse Helms and Jerry Falwell had come to Raleigh, I think, to give a speech, and we thought, this is going to be really fun. So they go down there, and they're the reporters. We all went to sort of cheer them on. And they came back, and um, in most of the time at the Independent, you weren't writing on deadline. It was a bi-weekly or a weekly, and you had plenty of time to write your story. Well, they didn't. They had to write the story that afternoon. So they had to act like daily newspaper reporters. We threw them into the walk-in closet, and Barry and Steve were in there, you know, joshing and joking and trying to write the lead 55 times and being clever, and, you know, they're, and they've been in there for like a couple of hours. And they're getting close, and they've done quite a bit of work. And I believe it was Jim that came in in the late afternoon and needed to plug something in. <laughs> so you know where this is going. You know, hey, man, put his, his K Pro down or whatever it was. And he pulled out the plug next to the clock and plugged in his whatever it was. And you could hear the scream come out because, you know, they had forgotten to say it. So all of you experienced similar things. But that's what it, that's how hard it was. Um, you know, I think yeah. that it was Veronica Templeton. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you're right, dude. I, I, I want to blame it on Jim. So, so, some, things, so, some things apparently you never forget. Yeah. So you, you know exactly who did that. Yes, and, that's exactly and, right. and she will be remembered <laughs> to your dying day. Yeah. That's, other, uh, that's, that's a, that's a one great more. story. Yeah. One more. One more question. Oh, two more, okay. Two more. Um, so, um, 
I've been in this area since 99 and have been picking up the indie and really appreciate um, I've really appreciated the, the uh, especially the, the election coverage. Um, and so I just want to want to say that. And um, um, as you were talking, I think Barry, you said that uh, Vindy was constantly keeping ahead of other publications and uh, you know would do a feature story before the News and Observer started doing them. Um, or would do uh, investigative stories before other publications. What's the next um, kind of big thing, or what, what are the next big things? That's a great question. Um, what, what are the next big things? I'm, I'm, I'm waiting with, with <laughs> eager, eager ears, Barry. Beats me. I, you know, um, we, we we, we are obviously entering an era where where journalism is being expressed in a lot of different ways, and um, um, there's been there's there have been all sorts of interesting um, um, efforts of weaving you know print narrative and multimedia, for example. Um, 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 is there some some all weekly spin on that? Um, um, is there some way? Of making journalism, you know, more more narrative rich, while also having more multimedia bells and whistles. Um, I, I think that I think that the um, the alt weekly as the sole repository of um, of forward momentum um, is no, you know, um, that that's an era era that has passed. Because, because there are so many options, but but because because it no longer has a monopoly, um, it has to figure out um, where, where 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 its niche is, and, um, and I don't know the answer to that. I think it's I think it's a fascinating um, question. Question, not though. Um, other folks. Yes. Um, well, I I just think editorially. Um, there's still a you know very strong need for um, real thoughtful journalism, and also the kind that isn't you know cable ready and you know instant news and that sort of thing. So I, yes, it's true that you have to compete with Twitter and blogs and and cable and all of that, but you have something to offer that people really want. So I would say. Keep looking at the stories that are right under your nose that nobody else is doing. And I, I've got I've got a story idea for you. <laughs> I think it's the independent's job to write the story of what went wrong with the Democrats, North Carolina Democrats. Yeah. Um, nobody's doing it. The Democrats aren't doing it. They're not being honest with themselves about what went wrong. They just want to blame it on the Republicans. And I'm sorry, it's not just about money and about Republicans. It's about the Democrats. And um, there's a lot of independents out there. There's a lot of Democrats who have been around for a long time. And Barry, you're the guy to do it. <laughs> there, there you go. There's there's a challenge. I think we have time maybe for one more question. Yes. It's okay. I was just going to ask how you saw the internet um, and just news print, actual papers, because I'm one of those people, I love holding a newspaper. I like turning the pages and reading it. Um, and I just was curious as to, to where you saw that coming, and you have, have addressed part of that already. Great. Before we wind up, uh, are there any parting comments that any of you want to make, that well, to make? If I could make one, as one yeah. of the people who sort of bailed out early, so can't claim <laughs> Too much credit for the long-term success. Part of my job since that point has been evaluating businesses. So, I, and I don't do that much forensics. And Marty and I used to share those quite a bit. I don't usually do rearview mirror forensics. But if I were to look at the independent, what I would say about it is that it built a very solid social mission. It provided a really good work life working life, not always the greatest salary for its people, but a good place to work for the people who were there, built a phenomenal editorial staff with people who did just amazing things, who won more awards per square inch of copy than most publications can ever claim to do. 
and when it was time, made it through a nearly 30 year lifetime, which is very unusual for a small business, any kind of small business, to last for that long. And when it was time to sell it, they, Steve sold out to one of the papers that we had always used as one of the examples that we would look at regularly because the Willamette Weekly in Portland was more committed to journalism, more committed to news, more committed to what had infused the independent from its initial days than virtually any of the other papers we saw in the National Association of Alternative News Weeklies. So I really think that the, the folks who built that long history for the for the independent and particularly Steve is that uh, that initial leader that got us all into this crazy venture really deserve an amazing uh, debt of gratitude from the community because they did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, do you want to have the last word? Uh, sure. My parting word is what I think of when I see these people up here. What I, what I, my last kind of thought about it is, is, is how young we were. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was 32, Elisa and Ann, you were probably 22 or something like that. Uh, and, you know, it was the kind of thing one only does when one is, you know, young enough not to know better. Uh, but it, it did make for, you know, we, we had the ability, I mean, uh, Jim, Jim has an, a unique ability he can drive and label envelopes at the same time. And, uh, you know, this was the kind of thing you would only do at a certain time in your life. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as, as uh, I, can't, I can't remember, maybe it was, it was Ann or Sue who was saying, you know, if you, if you worked on the editorial staff, you had to deliver newspapers. You know, it was just like part of what you did. Um, and, uh, and so I like to remember that. You know, I like to remember that time when we had that kind of, uh, you know, it was like a heroic outlook on life, you know, and, and, and maybe, maybe that's what allowed us to keep doing it for so long is because, you know, we, we started at that place. But youth is a beautiful thing, and I wish I had it back. <laughs> that, that seems like a thing that goes on. Thank you all Thank very, you. very much for coming.